public higher education. Public higher education makes a difference for everyone. In New York State, there are well over 300 institutions of higher education, colleges, universities, medical schools, but there are not as many opportunities as there are with public higher education. I'd like to start with my story and tell you why I'm so committed and so passionate about public higher education, because it really is about opening doors for everyone. And so I'm gonna start with my story. So this is me many years ago when I would say dinosaurs roamed the earth. <laughs> And I was there on my father's knee as a little girl who told me, you can be anything. The world is yours. If you study hard in school, Johanna, one day you are going to go to college. But you have to study. And you have to do all the things right. But for you, you will have an opportunity like no other. I believed him because my parents, my parents knew everything. They were the wisdom of the world. Well, as you know, things are never that easy. Um, so in my case, um, I, again, I was very committed. I was going to go to college, and I did study. But in 1954, there was a Supreme Court decision that separate but equal schools uh, segregation was unconstitutional. So I was bused to a school. Being bused to a school meant that I lived in one neighborhood, and I was bused to another neighborhood where there was a higher performing school. I have to tell you, it was wonderful. It was fabulous. I went to the school, and it was bright and open and eerie, and everybody was so friendly. I learned lots of things. I, um, I remember it so well. Mrs. Asbury was as encouraging as my parents were. Mrs. Asbury said, Johanna, if you study hard, you're going to go far. I can see you making it one day. And so I, I believed her, too. I could not have been more excited. Then my parents, and I will tell you that we did not grow up with great wealth. In fact, we lived probably paycheck to paycheck. My father was a waiter, and my mother was a stay-at-home mom. And so, you know, money was certainly an issue. But my father worked extra jobs. He, was, you know, he would work overtime. And during the course of this time, we got a better house. So we moved to a better neighborhood. But now, I moved, when we moved, I was going to the neighborhood school, which was a lower performing school. My first day of school, I'm looking and I'm thinking, I already learned all these things. I'm in the third grade, and I'm, and I'm thinking, I'm a genius. You know, these kids, they're just learning how to read. I was reading the encyclopedia. Students were just learning how to print. I already knew script. They were learning their numbers. I knew my times tables. So this was a good time for me. Now, you see that little TV that was in, that's in the corner? Boy, did I have a good time with it. I would go home from school, and I was, I was watching The Little Rascals and Looney Tune cartoons, and I was having a good time. My parents knew something was wrong. They said, how come you don't have any homework? How come you're doing so good in school, and yet you don't seem to be applying yourself the way you did before? So they went, they went up to the school, and they questioned the administrators, and they told my parents, the reason is Johanna is exceptional. She's gifted. And what we're going to do is we're going to skip her a grade, and we're going to put her in SP classes, which was special performance at the time. So that was fine. What that meant was for me, for the rest of my tenure, in my public elementary school, I got a pretty good education, because I was with the higher performing students, by fault. But the, at the end of the day, I left a lot of students behind. There were a lot of students who were still learning how to read. There were students who were still learning how to do their numbers who were in that class, who did not have the opportunity that I had to go to a higher level. That was really important. I looked at it and I wondered as I moved on. So, did okay. Again, not exceptional. I was not a rocket scientist. Although I thought about it, I said, well, they'll be a teacher, a sociologist, an astronaut. I had all kinds of plans for my future. 
But then I went to high school, and again, an average student, and I met with my college advisor. Now I had all of these, I'm sorry, I had all of these things planned. I had an academic diploma, which meant that I was college bound. I'd studied well, I had pretty good grades. But when I met with my academic advisor, stereotypes being what they were at the time, I was told that I wasn't college material. And I should find another plan of action. I thought to myself, he must have made a mistake. Doesn't he know I had all of these, all of these plans? And doesn't he know what my grades are? I, of course I'm going to college. And that was when I really understood in my heart the value of public higher education. That's when I knew there were other opportunities that were open to me. They say mentors can be moments. This was a moment that mentored me because I looked at what opportunities were possible. There were wonderful schools in my neighborhood. Um, St. John's University, Long Island University, there were lots of options, but they were not options for me. We could not afford it. But what we could afford was Queens College, which was part of the City University of New York. Well, eventually I did graduate from Queens College and then later Baruch, uh, Baruch College, and again, an opportunity for me. But you know, sometimes folks talk about um, giving back, they talk about paying it forward. I want to speak about responsibility. As I talked about those children that were left behind when I went ahead and when I had the benefit of a higher education because of public institutions, I realized that I had to be a part of the solution, that I truly did have the power to make a difference in the life I wanted for me and for others. So I'm going to introduce you to this school. This is a school that's uh, located in Queens, and by the way, is still there. This school is called the Louis Armstrong Middle School. In those days, um, again, I went to junior high school, but then there was middle school, intermediate school, all pretty much the same thing. It was called the Louis Armstrong Middle School because it was in the neighborhood where Louis Armstrong actually grew up with his family. It was on the border of two very distinct neighborhoods. One was black and Hispanic and really, really poor. And most of the children that had to go to the school in that neighborhood would have gone to a school that was quite dilapidated. Paint falling from the ceiling, books that were destroyed. It was a bad situation. <coughs> and then there was this middle school. The kids that were zoned for this middle school were from Sunnyside, Queens. Sunnyside, Queens was a much wealthier neighborhood. And the children that lived in, in that neighborhood were not about to travel to go to what they considered they <coughs> weren't going to do it. So at the time, my very first job, Queens College, Queens College decided that they could do something different. They could do something different that had not been done before. Do away with forced busing. Come up with a school that parents would want to send their children to. So in combination with Queens College, and at the time, a gentleman named Dr. Dr. Saul Cohen, and Frank Macchiarola, who was the head of the New York City school system, they said, let's come together and figure out if we created a school that was so desirable that parents would want to send their children, that we wouldn't have to have mandated forced busing anymore. And so, as it turned out, for the Queens College professors, it was a wonderful <coughs> opportunity without spending one additional penny. The professors saw this as a clinical environment. So they, well, school was open from 7 o'clock in the morning till 7 o'clock at night. And they were able to be there and help the students and really make for a wonderful environment. Now, the thing that was written about is a great book on it, but for many of you, you may remember this was really the beginning, something we're familiar with, which are magnet schools. So now we talk about charter schools and schools of choice, but this was a very important pivotal moment when, again, higher education worked with K-12 to really change the world in which we live. And so as I talk about public higher education, I have to say, that community colleges are truly the heart of everything <coughs> that I speak about. 
Community colleges are the great equalizer. <coughs> community colleges don't turn anyone away. Community colleges provide great educational programs, but they also need students where they are. Growing up in, in Queens, which was obviously a, a more ur urban area, I learned when I moved to this area living upstate longer than really downstate, that po the great equalizer is truly poverty. Whether you are a child in an urban neighborhood or you're living on the <coughs> other side of the mountains of the Adirondacks, when you're poor and you don't have opportunities, public higher education can open the world for you. And that's why I love community colleges the way I do. They're also the community's college. So like a night like this, but cultural events, special <coughs> events of all kinds, they are made possible with our community's college. Um, also, great connection with business and industry. A couple of people think community colleges are pretty great. We've got some pretty famous alumni who've gone to community colleges. I'll give you a, a minute to take a look at the group. So they thought community colleges were pretty terrific too. And this public education did well by that. But I want to say to you that at this point in our life when we're listening to presentations about whether or not higher education is important at all, whether or not students actually have to go to college anymore, we all know that it is absolutely essential. When we look at public higher education and we look at the future and the possibilities for our future, we know the following. If you want a high paying career, more than high school is a necessity. But yet, when you look at our population in New York State, 40% of New Yorkers have a high school education or less. And yet, we know the jobs. Over 130,000 jobs are open today, 20,000 of which are in the high skill fields. Well. Who has the high-skilled programs but our community colleges? Whether it's advanced manufacturing or it's in healthcare, this is where you can find opportunities, opportunities that are really ahead of the curve. Now, as I speak about ahead of the curve, one of the things that community colleges have done that I think is really wonderful is to stay ahead of the curve. So I don't know how many of you remember before there were cell phones, but I'm sure everyone in this room has one whether it's in your pocketbook, or it's in your pocket, or it's actually on the table. It's just understood that cell phones are a reality. But you remember when they had the flip phone? Remember when they had that brick that was on the side of your face? I remember when a Blackberry was a piece of fruit. Things have changed. Now we have Galaxy and the iPad and the iPhone, so many different pieces of technology. It hurt me to my heart that I recently went to the Smithsonian Institution, this institute, institute, and I saw a Walkman. And I was like, dear God, I got one of those in my basement. Yeah. <laughs> the point is that technology is changing so fast. And the second new technology comes out, it's already out of date. And so one of the, one of the commitments we have to make is to make sure that we're ahead of the curve, that we are working with business and industry to make sure that we have those high skill jobs. Community colleges have nanotechnology, CNC machining, mechatronics, coding. It's all so very, very important to stay ahead of the curve, and I will tell you, other countries are doing that. I will also tell you that every year when I go to the American Association of Community Colleges, the people from the Netherlands to Scotland are wanting to learn more about what we do in America with community colleges and how we are making a difference for the people we care about. And then, of course, as I speak about people we care about, our veterans. Veterans are served at all institutions of higher education, but nobody does it better than our community colleges. We, when, when veterans come back from military service, we always say thank you for your service. But there's no better way to say thank you 
than to give them an opportunity to apply the skills and experience they've had during military service in a career of their own, a meaningful one. So as we talk about the future and all of the different things ahead of us, I think someone who is the, the former Undersecretary of Education and currently the president of the American Council of Education said it best, community colleges will save us all. They're the small community college, often in some of the most rural parts of our country, but they're making a difference in a way most don't expect. So what do we have to do to make sure that our institutions stay strong? Partnerships, partnerships, partnerships. You have to have partnerships with K-12 so that we're talking with our students, we're talking with our counselors, we're talking with administrators so students know this is an opportunity. With partnerships with four-year institutions, so for the students who want to transition and have continuing education, that they know there's a pathway. And of course, connections with business and industry. Last, your voice. Policymakers and legislators have to know that these community colleges, and I will say institutions of public higher education, matter to you and to your communities. So I will end with a story that I think tells it best. Recently, I um, was visiting one of our community college campuses with the new chancellor, and we went to visit this particular school. And we met a young woman at the age of 57. I'm going to call her Brenda for sake of this story. Brenda was so excited. She was full of life. And she told me about how she just graduated with her associate's degree. And I said, wow, it's really terrific. She said, oh, man, I've just put three children through school, and I feel as if my whole life has opened up. I'm going to get another associate's degree. And I said, well, why? She said, because I don't want to leave this place. This has meant everything to me. She said, the best job I ever had was when I was manager at Walmart. Most of my jobs have been Burger King and McDonald's, and I really didn't see the door open until I came to this community college. And she said, Johanna, honestly, I had the ruby slippers all along, just didn't know how to put them. And so for that, I say thank you, everyone, and know that you truly have the power to see the change you want in education and in this world.